Hi, this is Pat Gunn, and this is another vlog. Uh, and it is the 20th of February, uh, and I guess I have a few things to talk about today. I took care of my taxes earlier today, and taxes always strike me as being one of those microcosms of the rest of life, where you always kind of have those little niggling doubts that you did it right, and it's just that there's, there are generally so many options, and there are always at least a few areas, even if you have very helpful software, where you're not sure whether you did it right, where there are legitimately, or probably legitimately, a few different ways to enter the same data, or what do I do with these extra numbers? It's kind of like having extra screws when you're trying to build something, and that you kind of want to plunk them all in somewhere and just hope that the software will figure it all out. That often isn't um, quite the way it works. And so you really only ever find out if you did an okay job based on not getting negative feedback from, but basically you don't want to get audited or you don't want your software to yell at you. Um, generally the, the first one is more of the disastrous one because somebody might want you to physically go somewhere, bring lots of paperwork, and you might be facing lots of fines. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's generally, it, it's just one of those things where I think there are big parts of life that are like this, where theoretically there are maybe kind of right and kind of wrong answers, even if there's plenty in both buckets, and you just want to fall uh, not too far outside of the clustering around what the theoretically right answer should be. At least, that, that's what I think. Um, so I, I finished it up, and I think I owed New York State a fair chunk of money, and the federal government, they owe me a fair chunk of money, and the, the second is the latter, so I'll be getting a reasonably big refund, provided that I didn't screw it up somehow, um, which works out fine. I mean, really... Uh, all this stuff is about um, when you get the funds that are due you. I mean, you, you want to get the right answer, but it doesn't really matter, like, oh, I have a big refund coming or not, because you can just over-withhold, and you'll be almost guaranteed a big refund. Or you can uh, have all sorts of investments that you don't do estimated payments for or anything like that, and then you owe a lot of money. Uh, but you know, just a whole lot of th this is just about money that is theoretically, it, it's about the tension between the money that is theoretically due you and the money that is theoretically due to, due to the government. And when it comes in and, uh, and when each bit of government gets theirs doesn't really matter and you have a whole lot of flexibility if you know what, uh, know what you're doing and, and if you have for some reason, preferences as to whether you want to uh, have money that's theoretically yours coming back to you as part of a refund check uh, because you overwithheld or not. Um, but yeah, it's it's always just a little bit irritating because I generally most other countries the government kind of handles it all, and you just make sure that they get a feed of your financial information. And it, and paying your taxes, if it's not something that happens automatically, it's just something you log onto a website, you already have all your information there, you largely click OK. Um, admittedly, finances are kind of complicated, and maybe you might... There might exist some reasons why people might want to be able to do different things, like basically have variants in how their taxes work, but, or if they're like really crazy paranoid, it's like, oh my goodness, the government is the evil, or something like that, then they might be wary of just feeding that stuff right to the, uh, to the IRS. I've never been worried about that. And I, I would be um, pleased as punch if just all my information automatically went to the IRS. They took care of it and the withholdings and stuff were automatically adjusted between them and my employer so that it's always a zero balance. Uh, no refunds, no writing checks, and really no hassle. That, that would be great. 
Um, but we don't have that in this country because of the way that the tax preparation firms have lobbied. So this is what we get. Uh, a government obligation that is mediated by private actors, which kind of sucks. There's no reason for that market to exist. It's inherently artificial, but uh, what can you do? If you've seen my previous videos, you'll notice that the background has changed a little bit. I decided to move my, uh, my stuff well, I decided to move my primary computer area much closer to the door in my apartment. It, it's not a very big apartment. Like, if you're not living in New York, you would find this apartment to be incredibly tiny. Um, in particular, if you don't live in Manhattan. Like, this is something like 250 square feet, maybe 300. Um, but I decided to move my computer stuff much nearer the door so that I would have the desk that I was previously using for computing just available for sketching and writing and thinking. Um, the hope behind that was to encourage me to do more of the uh, more of that writing and sketching uh, by devoting a space to it. And it's kind of worked. I've been a little bit too busy with stuff at work to really see if it shapes my behavior in the way that I hope. But I at least have those hopes. I, I think when things calm down a little bit at work and I have more me time, I will be able to get more work done. Or, I mean, it's not all work. Get all, get more non-gaming stuff done. Just by, and, and non, like, fun programming stuff done. Just by, by having, like, this is where the computer stuff happens, and over there is where uh, the writing and thinking and stuff like that happens. I hope that works out. I've been thinking about trying to pack an easel into the apartment, uh, but I just, looking around, there really isn't anywhere to put it, um, which is a bummer. I mean, same thing with musical instruments. I would love to have a place where I could have a violin or a string bass or something like that, but I just, there's no way for me to really fit that in to this apartment. I mean, even if I didn't have to worry about disturbing the neighbors, which, I mean, it's important not to, not to be a douche to, um, to neighbors when their concerns are reasonable. I mean, there are some people who overemphasize kindness and that's like, oh, if they're reacting badly, then you must have done something wrong. I don't believe that. Uh, I think that the proper balance between people generally is best drawn in the abstract. Uh, and maybe with some allowances between particular people, but you don't want to bend too far in that direction. Anyhow, the only the only downside of having moved uh, here is that my apartment doesn't have flat fo uh, floors, so things tend to slide in this uh, area of the apartment. The entire building is really kind of rubbish in this regards. Uh, it the stairs that go up to I'm, I'm living on the third floor and the stairs that lead up here are really pretty slanted um from what i understand the building had begun to sunk sometime in the 50s or 60s and then it stopped sinking in the 90s but it was but by then it was pretty slanted and they had some renovations that kind of tried to fix it and they never really worked uh it's pretty annoying but that's life um, the, the other thing about, um, the taxes that, or the, the other thing about, uh, every time I do my taxes, it's always annoying that my bank PNC has, it, it's interface has never struck me as being sanely designed. Um, and in particular, if you're using its online banking feature and you want to find out where your uh, 1099 forms are, which are useful if you're investing with your bank and I am, um, largely because their expense ratios are actually quite good um, for Vanguard funds. And since my investment strategy generally is dump about 80 or 90% of your investment into an S&P 500 fund. 
then then finding one with a really low expense ratio is a big win. So I do invest with them, but man, they, they make it really, really hard to find your 1099 forms. Um, the only way that I found it this time was to find a place where it used to be, and then it took me to a link to a completely different part of the website that I had previously felt that I had searched exhaustively, but it took me to a page that I'm not sure there, uh, there exist links to it in the, in the section where it should theoretically belong. Um, and there are my 1099 forms were. Um, the other thing that I did was I dug out an old wireless scanner. I've always been kind of frustrated with, uh, with scanners. Um, I, I realized like as a programmer working for a big tech company, I shouldn't be particularly averse to these, but yeah, scanners have scanners and maybe printers just, they are very fussy, irritating things to work with. And, um, and one way that I finally put an end to a lot of the hassle of dealing with scanners is I specifically bought a scanner that was designed for, uh, for sending its data to an Android phone. And this way I wouldn't have to install drivers, wouldn't really have to mess with anything. Uh, and actually, as a side benefit, the scanner itself is portable. Like, it's a brick about this big doesn't weigh very much, like it literally could, almost literally, uh, literally could just fit in the space between my hands uh, here. And um, and I can carry it around, it, it has a built-in battery, you do have to charge it. But it's really great if your intended use case is to scan something and stick it on Google Drive, which is primarily my workflow. Like when I wanna do taxes, typically a few days before, I'll start looking for and scanning stuff. And when I think I have everything, and when that, that particular Google Drive folder has all the files that I think I'm going to need to be able to do my taxes, then I finally sit down um, and just work with the digital copy of those documents. Um, and uh, and it's very fast, rather than dealing with like the physical paper and, oh shoot, did, did I misplace that? Plus, the, the gathering just feels like something where you can easily do it piecemeal. Like, you don't have to be searching continually until you find everything. It can be just, okay, I'm going to start keeping an eye out for this document. And then, eventually, they'll show up, and you'll scan them. And then you put, uh, put them in long-term storage. And eventually, everything shows up, hopefully. And then you can do what you need to do. And this is kind of the way that I approach a lot of financial and other like planning requiring operations. Like if I'm gonna take a vacation, I won't just sit down and plan it all. I'll just try and set it up so I can devote maybe five or 10 minutes at a time. And, uh, and then eventually bit by bit, things come together. And as it, there are benefits to this and that A, you don't have to get bored. But B, you can chew on things and think about them just because you're bringing it into your mental context several times and, uh, and, and letting it leave that mental context. And sometimes it happens while you're thinking about it directly. Sometimes you just might be having lunch and an idea will come to you like, oh, while I'm in Paris, I should go visit that mustard shop that I did the last time that has really good mustard or something like that. Um, or, oh, I think I read about, uh, uh, the Sorbonne apparently has a really neat campus. So I'll try and fit in a visit to there. Um, and so just in, I just think this is kind of a, a good life philosophy. Like don't, don't try to overdraw on your attention in, uh, whenever you're trying to do something, unless you really, really have to do it in a short period of time. Just plant plant things in your head, and see what happens in in the uh, in the background. Like when you're thinking about other things, see what ideas pop in related to that over a certain period of time, and then eventually it feels like uh, the moment is ripe to actually then spend the concerted effort to pull things together into something solid. 
So it is um, kind of late-ish February, but the weather has been getting pretty nice. Um, it's a little bit surprising how warm it, uh, warm it is, but I've been able to open my windows and air out the apartment, which is nice. Um, I'm really looking forward to actually having warm weather in Manhattan because I um, I moved right near a park called the High Line, which it's not the best of parks, but it is kind of a, a neat park to walk up and down. It's basically a, a old um, old elevated train line, I think, that uh, lost its train line a long time ago. I don't think it was a passenger train. I think it was a freight train that went through Manhattan, um, like maybe in the 30s or 40s. And so now it's an uh, elevated park, which is uh, yeah, uh, like li living li almost literally uh, next to it means that I've been looking forward to the weather getting nice um, to go check it out. And again, I've been too busy with work recently to spend much time at all on non-personal uh, things. Um, also, part of this has been that my health hasn't been that great recently. Uh, I suffer... Uh, migraines, like pretty bad migraines, and I typically lose like maybe somewhere between 8 and 20 hours a week to various levels of nasty pain. Um, I, I mean, I, because I believe in organizing things and spreadsheets and calendars and stuff, I have an organizational system for deal, uh, for keeping track of migraines. I always mark it on Google Calendar. And have a terminology for how bad a migraine is. Like, there's something that I just call a pre-migraine, where there's like a tightness in the head, but it might not develop into a proper migraine. It just feels like a high risk kind of feeling. And then there's what I'd call a mild grain, uh, which is a migraine that I can kind of function uh, to some degree, I can still kind of have conversations. I might not really want to keep my eyes open while having them. Uh, and I might be getting a little bit photosensitive on the higher ends of the scale. It's debilitating, but it's still kind of possible to work for brief periods of time. It's not very easy to code. Um, and usually I will go home if I have one of these. Um, and then things get up to moderate migraines, where I'm seriously pretty out of it. Uh, and I'm typically like trying to use meditative techniques that I uh, learned back in high school to reduce the pain. Like, uh, that's, that's really the only use of meditation in my life right now, or almost the only use. Um, I, d I don't even know if meditation is quite the right word for it, but there are mental techniques for lessening pain and working on pain. And I'm imagining that what's really happening behind the scenes is that there might be some semi-conscious level of control over endorphins, or uh, maybe that, no, probably not, but, uh, but some amount of control over the... Uh, over the pain response. And so if I work on it and I, I really focus, uh, like typically I'm, I'm look almost completely dead to the world and I'm not really seeing anything or interacting with the outside world much at all while this is happening. But, um, and there's no way like I could imagine doing work or relief and having a conversation while I'm having a, 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 what I'm calling a moderate migraine. Uh, but, but there are things that I can do to reduce the, uh, reduce the pain somewhat. Um, and you, you, it's basically what you have to do to mentally hang on, to mentally survive. Um, and yeah, the, the moderate migraines are like really quite bad. Um, like, typically, I, I almost entirely lose track of time while it's going on. If I am getting up, typically, it's just to take very, very hot showers, like, basically turning it all the way up, uh, spraying it right on my head, which hurts, but it hurts a lot less than the migraine does, and it can help with the migraine a little bit. Or drinking, like, almost boiling water. 
which also seems to help to a certain extent. And then there's what I would call the severe migraines, where typically there's no, uh, like I completely lose uh, all sense of the world, uh, and it's, it's basically thrashing, and uh, yeah, I've fortunately those are not very common for me, uh, but they tend to be really extraordinarily draining. Um, and it's like, un unlike the mild or moderate migraines where I'll get like a post migraine high and actually feel like quite good after it passes, typically after like a severe migraine, uh, I'm just so, so exhausted that, uh, yeah, it, there's, there's really no post migraine high there. And I'm generally not going to be functional for quite some time, even after the migraine has definitively passed. Uh, past, which is not the case for one of the priors. Like, if if I were having a mild migraine or a moderate migraine, and it ended, it, it definitively ended, then I'm good. Like, literally, there's, I, I might want to take a shower because I probably uh, would be a bit of a mess. But um, but I literally like am completely fine when one of those migraines passes. Uh, but for for a severe migraine. It's just I am beat, uh, and I will need to spend like uh, I'll, I'll at least need to like have a uh, have a good amount of sleep, maybe even spend a whole day recovering from one of those. Um, yeah, they're they're probably the worst thing in my life. I mean, like loneliness kind of sucks too, uh, but but the migraines just when you get, when you get used to like having that level of pain. For long enough, it, it's very draining. Um, anyhow, moving on to other topics. Uh, so recently, I I spotted uh, there's a figure who's described as being alt right, Milo Yiannopoulos, um, who's a British journalist uh, and kind of like a shock jock style journalist. Um, I really didn't know anything about him before. Uh, I was only the most vaguely aware of his existence. Uh, like I'd heard the name probably and maybe had a very vague idea of the concept. And he recently was on um, Bill Maher's uh, show. And I thought like there was an initial, uh, there was an initial interview that was a back and forth between him and Bill Maher. And there he seemed almost reasonable. I mean, A, he is pretty cute. Uh, but he he seemed to be making a lot of decent points about the dangers uh, of the directions in which American society has progressed, uh, at least on the social front. I didn't really agree with him much on the legal slash governmental front. Um, there, I, I think that the direction that he would point society in, in particular, small government, um, somewhat expanded uh, notions of uh, of libel, things like that. I, I don't think that those are positive, and I, I don't think I could see myself agreeing with them. Milo has aligned himself to a certain extent with Trump, and this struck me as odd. I mean, I guess it, it shows how unusual a political figure is that uh, that Trump is, and that he's not recognizably conservative, but he is recognizably anti-liberal in certain ways, or at least anti-progressive. And given that I, I don't particularly like progressive flavors of liberalism, like I'm more of a uh, socialist style, old left with some libertarian ideas mixed in, um, and a certain amount of respect for, um, or respect is not quite the right word, but um, with a certain amount of worry for the pushiness of liberal social projects, particularly progressive so social projects. I, so, so what this meant is that Unlike Trump, where I really don't find myself having much ideological overlap, um, 
I mean, there are a, f a few areas of, uh, of overlap on some topics, but by and large, it's, uh, he sees the world in a very different way than I do. I found myself having a little bit more of an overlap with, with Milo, at least as far as I could tell based on that uh, on that one-on-one -on -one with Vilmar. Um, Milo does seem to be deliberately abrasive, and he was much more abrasive than I... I like in in the context of serious conversation, and that's one of the things that struck me about him, and that he seems to, in the role that he is taking in society, is more of a jester than a serious advocate of ideas. I think, or at least maybe it's just that I really like to have thicker boundaries between when something is being done as comedy versus when something is seriously being advocated as an idea. Um, it's not that I usually want to tr uh, have the law or institutions treat those differently, but it would treat how I would think about people, uh, people's words, and in particular how I would treat um, the discourse standards that they're holding. The, the reason this comes up is that after that initial back and forth with Bill Maher, there was then a panel discussion, and I actually saw this a few days later after I had some time to think about the, the first bits. And there, Milo was really being pretty douchey. Uh, and I I guess I, I wasn't nearly as, as cool with that, in, in that I, I think it's healthy when you're having a discussion with a bunch of people to try to be civil uh, not necessarily to respect their opinions or views or avoid offending them, but try not to spit in their face uh, um, while directly conversing with them. And and Milo in, in this particular uh, panel session, he was directly insulting the, the people around him. And it predictably devolved because he was ill-behaved the people around him were also ill-behaved, and so it kind of devolved into, well, fuck you, well, fuck you, that, that kind of childlike back and forth. Um, and I, I guess you eventually kind of expect that. I, I would, would It would have been nice to have seen them not rise to the occasion, but he created the situation that led to it. And so I, I really think that he kind of had the blame for it not being a particularly good conversation because he decided to be non-civil. But I just I have a tough time knowing how serious to, to take Milo's ideas. And I don't like that. I, I would rather it be clear, or at least more clear, when somebody is joking or letting off steam. Uh, and when you're joking, sure. You can say things uh, that, like when, when you're not in the room with somebody, I think it's it's fine to poke fun at them, um, even if they're not there, or maybe more particularly when they're not there, uh, like criticizing people for their views uh, or really anything else, poking fun at them, fine. But just when you're actually having the conversation, civility, I think, is a plus. But it just... Um, yeah, it, it it didn't it didn't seem like he he was keeping an adequate distance between like I'm talking to the entire world, expressing myself super freely, and so on. Versus I'm in a conversation with somebody and I'm going to call them stupid. Uh, and yeah, I, I I was just disappointed, particularly because I would like to see the points that he's taking or the, the points that he's advocating, advocated by somebody who's not trying to be that kind of lightning rod, but maybe to somebody who's like, hey, I have my views, if you don't like them, move me, asshole, which is generally the view that like people should take in politics. Uh, like nobody, nobody should ever pick their views because they're going to make other people happy or because somebody criticized their views. That's a shoddy way to change your views, even if they're just arbitrary ones that you were raised with. You should have some kind of a reason, like a changed heart, or 
heard a really good argument, or oh, I'm shifting some my uh, some of my other views around, uh, and it feels like this one should shift to something like that. Um, but anyhow, uh, so to to yeah, just just to sum up, I, I think a lot of the things that. Milo says are sensible. A lot of them are not so sensible. I'm glad that he's doing what he's doing. I think it's rubbish that uh, that some campuses have seen various forms of liberal activism attempting to uninvite him or disrupt his events. I think it's really important that campuses be places where uh, a wide variety of views can be explored, and that diversity of ideas is essential to universities. Um, I mean, ideally, you want to have diverse people exploring diverse ideas, but I, I, I think so long as you're not locking people out who are not diverse, as so long as you're not preventing them from joining, if they're only not joining because they're not comfortable with the diversity of ideas expressed, then you know you shouldn't care about them because the diversity of ideas is more important. But you really ideally should want both. Um, I think universities serve an important role in society to expose people to ideas that they hadn't considered before. And as much as in the past I've talked about how important it is that particularly people from conservative small communities, they leave those communities and go and see the variety of ideas that they might never have seen in their little hometown. It's also just as true that, um, uh, in my view, that, that liberals should be getting out of their bubble and be exposed with ideas that they really are not comfortable with, and take that as a growing experience. Um, so, yeah, but, but I think we need to have more people like him, but maybe, uh, a little bit less of a showman. I guess there's the danger that if somebody isn't a showman, they won't really reach prominence and they might not be able to raise attention to these issues. And there are really important issues that he's pushing. Like the 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 idea of free speech as being not just a legal idea, but a social one. And no, I'm not talking about the censorious liberal flavor of that or the censorious um, conser conservative flavor of that, like they've, you'll see both conservatives and liberals co-opting the notion of free speech to really mean more sp speech for people that I, I like, whether that be like oppressed minorities or the church or something like that, and somehow they twist it around into being an argument for res restricting speech in the neighbor of, uh, in the name of free speech. Uh, no, I'm, I'm talking about the idea of so much as we can arrange it, consequence, uh, consequenceless speech, trying to make it so that when people express their ideas, they're primarily not judged uh, punitively by uh, for the content of their ideas so much as the nature of their expression. Like if you're going to burn a flag, it shouldn't matter if it's the American flag or just a blank sheet of paper. If it's a fire hazard, either way, you might not be allowed to do it, but nobody uh, really cares about the symbolic nature of the act. And likewise, we need to have in the private sector, in circles of friends, in broad society, room for a great diversity of views and the expression of those views. And that, I think, is is the, the social idea of uh, free speech rather than the legal one. And I think the social idea is really important to, uh, to push, pretty, uh, probably just as much as the legal one. And, and this is why I, I worry when you end up having like politicization of workplaces and official opinions of employers and things like that, because they end up stifling um, this social notion of free speech. Um, so moving on to a few other really unrelated topics, since I guess I'm a little bit over half an hour in and I don't really want these to ever get uh, longer than an hour, because I'm not sure I can upload more than an hour. Um, I My gaming rig here, uh, which you can't really see, but it's the system that I'm recording this on, 
it has two GTX 1080 graphics cards, which at least as of this writing uh, are some of the more powerful graphics cards that you can get. It's kind of, I decided to buy a top of the line um, gaming rig at least once in my life. I uh, guess it kind of makes sense, like move to Manhattan, get a top of the rig uh, gaming uh, system, so on. But one of the problems with the system as it showed up was uh, that they didn't have the uh, the connector between those cards uh, having uh, it didn't ship with the right uh, with the right interlink uh, device and I only recently noticed I got some hints before that that it probably wasn't the right interlink device because in the driver's page, uh, it kept on warning uh, warning me, uh, you you don't have a uh, a, con uh, a connector that supports the higher bandwidth that these cards are supposed to have. And I always just thought maybe it's wrong, but finally I uh, I opened up the case. It is a little bit weird, but again for a Windows box, I generally don't open them uh, don't open them up because I don't really care what's inside them. They're not systems that I love. They're just boring, functional gaming rigs or whatever. But I actually opened it up, took a look, and sure enough, it wasn't actually the um, the connector that the uh, that my computer vendor or my gaming computer vendor said it was. It was actually just a uh, a cheaper, older connector from a um, not by NVIDIA, but by a company called MSI. So this was disappointing. It meant that my hardware vendor lied to me, which uh, not so cool, but I've had the system for quite some time now, not really worth following up with them. So I ordered, I went onto NVIDIA's website and I ordered this guy, which is the, um, it's the interlink that is meant to be used for GTX 1080s. And it finally arrived, and I went to plug it in, and I was enormously frustrated to find out that, so you probably can't really tell super well based on this, but this is two uh, um, PCI slot heights um, high. And the GTX 1080 is actually two in itself, so this is meant to connect cards that are literally like stacked right on top of each other. So, but unfortunately, the, the way that the cards are on my motherboard, there's actually a card in between, uh, a NIC. And uh, so I thought, well, maybe I'll move it around. So I, I removed the NIC, and then I found out that, no, the connectors for the G GTX 1080 differ from ordinary PCI connectors, and meaning that there are only two places on the motherboard that you can stick, uh, or on the motherboard that I have, that you can stick a GTX 1080 and they force the, the two cards to be three slots apart rather than two. So this wouldn't fit. Which uh, I, I then went back to NVIDIA's website to see, well, maybe it feels a little bit unlikely, but it just feels like bad motherboard design, but maybe there is a way that I can find a connector uh, either from NVIDIA or from a third party that will let me connect my cards using their current layout because I can't move them around. And sure enough, when I was actually ordering that thing, I uh, I misread what the other devices available were. Uh, because uh, th that thing was labeled as a two-slot connector. And then there were three and four-slot connectors, and what I thought that meant was that there were um, uh, there were connector devices that would let you connect more than two GTX 1080s, um, which is not a really a supported configuration, and that there was a little bit of grumbling when NVIDIA decided that the GTX 1080 could only officially be supported with uh, two cards doing SLI. But they said that it still would probably be possible to have three or four cards, but you would need to jump through some hoops, and most games wouldn't support it. Um, and so I thought that the other connectors were actually giving you physical connector support for having more than two cards. 
Uh, and no, no, it, it turns out that they actually were just meant uh, the the uh, the connector uh, the the three slot connector and the four slot connector were not meant to be slots uh, or how many cards you could hook up, but how far apart the cards are in your uh, slot stack on the motherboard. I'm missing the, the right words to talk about this. I don't build systems super often. Um, but uh, so yeah, I, I then ordered one with uh, with three. Hasn't arrived yet. Um, but I guess it'll be interesting to see like how different the experience is with the proper connector rather than the existing low bandwidth connector. Um, I have been speaking of that system in gaming. I've been enjoying Sniper Elite 4, which is a very enjoyable sniping game. There are... Uh, I've always enjoyed doing that in Fallout. And... Uh, or sniping in Fallout, basically. Uh, in, in the Fallout series of games, typically you can pick what kinds of uh, weapons you have. And there are various uh, guns and grenades and stuff like that. But I've always just enjoyed like staying super, super far away from my foes and shooting them when there's no way that they would even know that I'm around. And this doesn't work in some parts of the game because you're going through some kind of dungeon-y vaults and caves and stuff where you just can't possibly get sights on something far enough away um, because there's no like straight line of sight from where you are and where they are because there'd be caves in the way and stuff. But when you're outside, uh, typically that kind of strategy would work well. And this game is mostly about wandering around, I think, Italy um, and and sniping. And it's fun. It's, it's a lot of fun. It's not a particularly deep game. Uh, the plot is kind of cute, but the game kept on crashing while it was going through the plot points, so I've learned to skip them, and occasionally I had to reboot my system to get uh, to get it back to the point where it would uh, even start up again. So it's a little, it has some stability issues, but it's a very enjoyable game once you're into it, and I had a lot of fun. Um, so for Disgaea 2 for PC, it's been a little bit annoying because it doesn't support Creative Lab sound cards and pretty much only Creative Labs, like they're the only vendor where you can't successfully play um, play the game with them. But it turns out that the uh, NVIDIA graphics cards uh, that I have, they can, they can act as sound cards themselves and channel the sound over... Um, uh, over DisplayPort to built-in monitors, uh, or I mean built-in speakers on my monitor. It's not very nice speakers, but it works, and so uh, so I have been able to pl uh, to play this guy too, and it's been a great trip down memory lane. Um, I haven't had a whole lot of time to do it because again, work is keeping me busy, even on the weekends, but. And also migraines can steal a lot of time away too, but it's it's been enjoyable playing uh, um, this guy too, again. And I'm hoping that Nipponichi ends up uh, porting more of their back catalog to PC. There are a whole bunch of games, including Makai Kingdom, that never really had a definitive port to the West, uh, or at least never had um, a definitive with all the DLC port like remastered and with stuff mixed in from later games. Um, and so I'm hoping we'll get that. Uh, it'd be cool. Uh, and I guess uh, otherwise, my cats are still doing okay. Um, and I've had a amusing idea about how to think about cats, uh, like cats as companions, um, just because they're lazy, fussy um, critters that are also typically affectionate if you if you raise them right. Um, and they're mischievous and they don't really understand what you want in an apartment or anything like that. But I've been trying to treat my cats as if I believed in reincarnation and they before before they became cats, they had had a very rough but virtuous life as a human. 
and we're trying to give them a nice afterlife before they dive back into some cycle of reincarnation. And admittedly, I mean, that does sound kind of goofy. Uh, it sounds as ridiculous as like reincarnation or any other faith, but uh, but still, it's a I, I thought it was a cute sentiment, and all sorts of goofy stuff uh, pops into our head all the time. And so long as you're secure in who you are and what you believe, there's little harm in exploring ideas that aren't really deeply part of um, part of your worldview. So that's that's everything that I had planned to talk about. Um, I guess uh, I have had the joy of uh, hanging out a little bit more um, in uh, in video conferencing with uh, with my nephews. That's kind of nice. I have a new niece, but I haven't really had the time to meet. Uh, or I haven't been back to Cleveland to meet her in person yet. I'm hoping that I'll I'll get to do that sometime this year. Um, probably will. And, uh, yeah, I'm just really looking forward to the weather getting nicer and hopefully the workload at work getting lighter. Uh, it's, it's so nice to be able to open up windows and, uh, just have nice quiet days, uh, uh, that, that aren't like uncomfortable or anything like that. Um, still would theoretically be nice to, to find companionship, but there's always that difficulty given how central politics and worldviews tend to be in finding the right kind of deeply close relationships that if you're far enough off the beaten path, it means that you kind of have given up on that at least being easy or likely. But well, that's life and we all make choices and we have to live with them. Um, also hoping maybe to do some some travel, uh, some more travel this year. Uh, might might try and head back down to Texas uh, when the weather gets a little bit warmer. Although maybe it doesn't need to get too warm because I remember how warm Texas gets. Anyhow, that's it. Uh, again, if you have any questions, comments, ideas, uh, uh, leave them uh, leave them as comments below, and I might get to them in the next video. Take care.